Hey, the Dallas 100 Club is a division of Speakers for America, and it's an organization of 100 independent, responsible business people or companies that will each year make a contribution of $100. We'll take this money and turn it over to the widows of the slain policemen, or if we have any overlap or overlay, any surplus monies for policemen who are permanently injured in the line of duty then we'll also make a contribution to the families of these men. It started uh, in the southeastern part of the United States as a, as a sample uh, survey. Uh, we covered several hundred returns that uh, preparers made for taxpayers. And we were rather startled, very frankly, by the uh, results that we obtained. Uh, we'll now obviously look uh, nationwide. We're obviously going to audit a, an enormous number of returns that might not, other, not otherwise been uh, audited. We're going to make 15,000 internal revenue agents available yesterday, today. Uh, what is today? Friday? Uh, tomorrow and Monday uh, to help people throughout the United States prepare their returns. Uh, as a consequence of it. This central jury room is quiet now, but tomorrow morning noise will probably be bouncing off the walls. That's because the board of directors of the Dallas Community Action Agency is meeting here at 10 a.m. to hammer out a response to the OEO ultimatum to shape up the agency or lose federal funds. Well, there'll be plenty of protesting voices in this room. Board Chairman George Zimmerman has ordered the doors closed. Only board members will be allowed to attend the meeting. That includes DCA workers who won't be able to come in. Well, two of those workers who were cited in an OEO report for conflict of interest are challenging Zimmerman's ruling. Board member Stanley Gaines and Community Component Coordinator Eileen Hardy say that this closed door policy violates the open meeting law in Texas. Zimmerman says that his order stands because they'll be discussing personnel matters. DCA Executive Director Willis Johnson has issued an order too, a directive to all DCA employees, no more leaks to the news media. Johnson says that wrong information disseminated by the news media has caused virtual civil war within the DCA camp. He says that any employee who violates the no-talk order will be subject to either a firm reprimand or termination. Johnson says that all information must come through his office so that the public will be sure to get the facts. Martha McIntyre, Channel 8 News on the Move at the Dallas County Courthouse. One of the principles of these retreats, apparently, is to get out of Dallas, and so this year the council has come to Arlington for the weekend. Another principle, at least for some of the council members, is to look informal, a chance to be about the city's business without a coat and tie, possibly with sleeves rolled up or with shirt tail out, a much different appearance than normally projected. But even if appearances aren't too important at this retreat, the topics being discussed are... For example, that much-publicized Consumer Affairs Department proposed by Councilman Gary Weber was on this afternoon's agenda. The city manager's office recommended that such a department be organized within the framework of city government in Dallas, and most council members seem to agree. But underlying this, and all other discussion here, matters pertaining to money and to the new city budget. It's a tight budget. Uh... We have pledged ourselves to make every attempt to come up with a no tax increase budget for this next year. And uh, it will mean tightening our belts. We're going to have to get the very best out of every dollar that we spend. And uh, we will be holding down to a minimum on major new type programs. No final decision, though, will be made on new programs or on anything else during this retreat. Those decisions will be made during the regular city council meetings. But the matters which are discussed will help set the direction for the Dallas City Council in the months to come. Jack Hill, Channel 8 News on the Move. When, the, when you decided to file a suit? You mean the city attorney? Uh, well, of course, he, it's, 
he is, uh, he really has no other choice because he knows that the Attorney General will not certify the bonds unless they have the, the election pr uh, process is um, as the Attorney General interprets the state constitution. But do you feel the people that the ACLU is representing would be happy if, say, in 60 to 90 days the city applied to the Attorney General for certification of the library bonds? No, I don't believe so. I think that uh, it would not be attacking the problem. It, it would not clarify the issue, and, and the time has come when we simply can't go on not knowing how to have a bond election. Well, now, you know, this is the first morning we've been out here, and it's just great to be out here in baseball attire and seeing all these fellows uh, getting back in action a little bit. I'm, I'm pleased as I can be. What effect do you think this will have, say, when we get down to the end of the season? Somebody plays 153 games, some 155. Oh, I don't think that's going to mean a thing. Uh, you know, uh, in an ordinary season, this happens. So I think they did the smart thing by starting today and forget about the, the past. And, and what happens uh, as far as the schedule is concerned, I think it's as fair for one as it is the other. Do you think it will also mean a, a kind of a shaky start with not everybody being in tip-top shape? Well, it's possible that they, they're not going to be quite as... Uh, peak uh, as uh, they would have been if we'd have started right out of Florida, but uh, all of them have been working hard, and I think that you're going to find that in two or three days it'll just feel like they're right in the real groove of things, and, and I think uh, by the time we get back here uh, next week, why well, I think uh, everybody's going to feel just like they have just came out of Florida and they uh, starting the season. Do you like the first few weeks of the schedule, or does it really matter who you play? Well, I no, it doesn't make any difference who we play. I think if we're playing good ball, where well, we're going to be representable. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, a big factor in our concern, as far as I'm concerned, is that we're going to have good weather to start the season. Well, I guess it has to be a self-centered, maybe not self-centered reaction. I'm happy we're playing again because we are getting paid. But I'm glad that it was settled. I don't think anybody really won. The players set out what they were trying to accomplish, a better communication with the owners and themselves. And I think it was a worthwhile cause, what we did, but it hurt both sides, like all strikes do. But as I say, I'm glad it's over. Very delighted the strike is over. I'm glad to be back playing baseball again. Uh, it was tough, you know, just sitting around, picking up the paper every day, wondering what was going on. But as soon as I heard the strike was over, you know, just a big smile broke out on my face. And uh, so here I am, ready to go again. It was a tough thing. Uh, I definitely think we had to do it, though. Uh, I certainly hope that, uh, from a fan standpoint, that they can get our view of it. Uh, I think things may come out now that maybe they didn't know about, and uh, maybe some things will be straightened out. I know one thing, uh, our player rep, Don Mincher, did one heck of a job, I think, for us, and so did all the player reps. Well, I worked out uh, here in Arlington with uh, a few of the other ball players over at Random Mill Park, and then uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then at 3, I worked out with the UTA team. You think the feeling is mutual around the league? We'll get a good start, and uh, the strike will soon be forgotten. Right. I, I think uh, once we uh, get going, uh, there won't be any mention of the strike. I think the only time it'll be brought up when somebody asks, you know, why did you guys strike or something like that. Which reminds me, why did you guys strike? <laughs> This is Billy G's Air Conditioning and Heating Company in Fort Worth. It belongs to Billy Jean Winston, a retired Air Force Master Sergeant and an advisor on air conditioning technology to Tarrant County Junior College. He's also a teacher, at least in the sense that he hires disadvantaged people and makes air conditioning mechanics out of them. Billy G's first experience with this new way of helping people and helping his own company came through the NAB Jobs Program. The National Alliance of Businessmen offered the proposition that a man could hire the disadvantaged, work with them personally, teaching them his trade, and wind up with good employees for himself and productive, tax-paying members for his community. How's it working out for you? Real fine. Uh, we get along real nice down here. These boys came here with, in the beginning, I think they had a little negative attitudes, but uh, uh, we worked it out. And they're out doing a job just like uh, they've been at it for a long time now. They've been here for a little better than nine months now, and I turn them loose on the job themselves. They are familiar with the city codes, and they know how to put a unit in, and they do it right. What kind of work do they do exactly? They do all phases, from uh, basic refrigeration 
all the way to uh, commercial refrigeration and industrial. What kind of work are they doing today? They are putting in a central air conditioning in a home. You're going to put some more people on the jobs program? Yes, in the next two weeks we hope to be looking at some more boys from the jobs program. The contract's been approved and been funded and uh, we uh, hope to start hiring in the next two to three weeks. The trainees are paid two dollars per hour to start. They get raises just like anybody else when they've completed their training. They're subject to the same benefits and conditions as other employees of the plant. They're placed on the program through the Texas Employment Commission and the employer's problem of losing money by hiring disadvantaged employees is at least partially overcome by payments to the employer based on documented time which he devotes to training his people. The NAB says that the money from the program will be returned to the economy at least within three years because those people will then be making money and paying it back into the economy. There are presently 1,400 people on 58 job training programs of this type in Tarrant County. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move, Fort Worth. Well, <clears throat> I fish some myself. <laughs> I fish for books, and uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I play dominoes, and I sit around the Confederate monument home. <laughs> Douglas, we're honoring you today for something that you did the other day when you saved your little sister from ground, drowning. The Fort Worth Fire Department is giving to you this Notorious Fire Service Award, and it reads like this. This certificate of Notorious Service is awarded to Douglas C. Wood in recognition of humanitarian services to a fellow citizen in time of distress. Douglas, we are very, very proud of citizens like you, and we wish to honor you in this manner. Douglas, can you tell me what happened that day that Vicki fell in the swimming pool? Uh, I heard a splash, and I knew that nobody was swimming in there. I went in there, and she was in, in the water at the bottom of the pool. And I, and I jumped in after her with my clothes on. Can you I, swim? Uh, Why did you jump in there? Because I didn't want to drown. You love your sister?
Mr. Secretary, it's rumored that the president will seek a value-added tax this summer from the Congress. Do you support such a move? Well, first, I don't uh, concede that the rumor is correct, and I suspect that's all it is, is a rumor. I have no indication that the president uh, is going to seek a value-added tax from the Congress at any time, uh, much less this year. Do you feel it would relieve the property owner's tax role? Well, there's no question now. If you separate the two things, the president's made it very, very clear that he thinks property taxes are too high. He thinks something should be done about it. In the process of asking the Treasury to analyze what can be done about it, we've looked at a great many uh, possibilities, but uh, and including the value-added tax. But the value-added tax is something that the Treasury Department has worked on for over two years. We've made no recommendations uh, to the President on it. Uh, he certainly has made no decision on it. We hope that we can devise some type of a formula that will permit state and local governments uh, to reduce property taxes, because that's where the taxes are imposed. When you see the lunar rover on the ground, you can, you, your first question is, how can that thing possibly be stowed aboard the lunar module? Where does it fit? Well, it is stowed in what we call uh, quad one, which is just to the left. Uh, as we look out to the hatch, the front hatch is just to the left of the uh, steps. Uh, as the public sees it, uh, from the TV camera looking back at the limb, it will be just to the right of the, uh, uh, of the uh, ladder and the porch. The rover can be stowed on the, uh, on the uh, lunar module because it folds up much like a, uh, an airplane landing gear folds up into the, into the wing of an airplane. Uh, we steer and apply throttle through uh, one uh, stick, if you will, uh, that sits between the two crewmen. To go forward, uh, you just tilt the controller forward to steer right or left, you tilt the controller right or left, and the wheels respond. It's a very sporty little vehicle uh, in steering because with a four-wheel steering, uh, you can turn around uh, 360 degrees within the own radius of the, uh, of the, of the uh, rover. So you get a very tight turn out of it, and, uh, which is useful for navigating around craters, but at top speed, it makes it a sporty proposition to drive. Well, we're going to have to play that real tough style of hockey like we did in the third game up there. I mean, it was a big win for us, uh, tying the series up. And uh, I don't know, we haven't been physical until the last game up in Oklahoma City. And when we proved to be that way, you know, it proved successful, very successful, in fact. You've had a lot of, uh, well, ups and downs, I guess you have to say, this season. You really clinched it early, probably earlier than you would like to. You had to kind of get up again for the playoffs, didn't you? Well, uh, you know, clinching a pennant a month before the schedule's over, naturally you're going to have a mental letdown, you know, and the team's not, uh, wasn't really, uh, well, we had no pressure on us, and everything was just A-OK, -okay, you know, you just, uh, I don't know, but now, you know, we have to pick the momentum up again, uh, because in playoff hockey, uh, no matter where you stand, whether you're a league champion or whether you're not, you know, uh, anybody can beat you in any given night in playoff hockey. It must be a thrill, though, to stop a, a team on a power play when you're a two-man short, as you did a couple of times the other night. Well, J.P. LeBlanc did a great job for us. Uh, of course, he's did it all year for us, and our penalty killing, plus uh, J.P. Bordelow, has been a secret for our hockey club. We've been losing uh, well last game. Matter of fact, down two men as we were. I think that was a key point of the game, us killing that penalty. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, it was a long game, but uh, I'm not, personally, I wasn't that tired after the game. It was uh, The arena was really cool in there. Uh, more so than it is in this building here, I believe. How many uh, saves did you have? Somewhere around 50, was it? I think there were uh, 51 saves, 53 shots. That's uh, a lot more than usual, isn't it? Yeah, usually uh, 32, 33 shots a game is average. But then on the other hand, we went two extra periods, too. So it would even out, I guess, to an average game, really. 
What about tonight? Uh, would you like to win tonight and save that extra trip to Tussle? Definitely. I, th I think we're going to win tonight. Uh, at least I hope, hope we do. Uh, the guys are up for the game, and uh, I think we'll give a good, good showing of ourselves. Uh, Tulsa's going to come in, and they're going to have to be pressing. And uh, when the team starts doing that, uh, they start opening up uh, their defensive areas, and uh, we got the forwards who can over-skate them, and uh, I'm sure we can fill the net on them. Well, I think everyone generally accepts the idea that there is a nationwide epidemic of gonorrhea. I don't think Fort Worth is really any different. Uh, we treated 4,076 cases of gonorrhea in Fort Worth in 1971, and those are the reported cases that we know about. Do you think that the situation will get worse before it gets any better? Well, we are expecting to have some more help on the way in, uh, in terms of a federal grant application that we have pending now. And if, if this is the case, we hope to have three additional investigators. We hope to be able to screen about 27,000 women next year in Fort Worth. And probably before it actually goes down in terms of actual numbers of cases, we'll see an increase as a result of this intensified case finding application. And uh, after that, we would hope that we, do, we will see a significant decrease in the amount of gonorrhea. Is it enough just to say that all of you who hold public office are a bunch of crooks? Is it enough to say that those who would serve in public office have no regard for the people of this country? That they have no honor, that they have no integrity, that they have no compassion or concern for the people whom they purportedly serve? Is it enough just to say that? Is it enough to be a destructive force in this country? Is it enough to just tear down? Do we really realize what we're doing without being discriminating? Can we indict a people? Can we indict a class? 
I don't know of any profession in which there are not some who are guilty of, of indiscretion, at times even malfeasance. It's true in the ministry. You read about it often. A pastor or treasurer of a, of a church or of a synagogue will depart with all the funds. Bankers occasionally embezzle, but we ought not to destroy our banking system because of it. John Connolly. I wish your lovely wife was here because I would like to ask her this question. I understand that she has been an influence on you in getting you to kind of tone down the racial issue. Well, my wife has influence over me, but uh, I don't know how much political influence she has. Uh, her uncle ran against me, you know, in 1970, <laughs> and we were not married at that time. And uh, But uh, she has influence on me, but... Uh, I don't talk uh, quite as loud as I used to talk because uh, it's like I said last night when I plowed an, a mule back in Alabama as a young boy, sometimes he would balk and you'd have to go in front of him and thump him good uh, to make him uh, pay attention. I just thumped him now, I didn't hit him. I don't want to get anybody <laughs> who thinks I'm cruel to animals here today uh, and get that started on me, you know. But once uh, you got the mule's attention, he did a pretty good day's work. I think we've gotten the attention of the news media now, and they know that we are not uh, what they said we were, uh, that we're interested in philosophy, and uh, I think that was born out in the state of Wisconsin. I think it was born out in the state of Florida. Governor, uh, may I ask the second question now? Every president has had his thing, whether it be tennis, sports cars, golf, playing the piano, or swimming rivers. What is your thing? What do you do when you relax? 